Father, we humble whenever we can come before you, the creator of this universe, and to know that uh, you long to hear from us, you want to hear from us, and the Father, that you even hear us. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, it's, it's a mystery why you will uh, care for us, we who are but dust, and yet you formed us in your own image, and you so, so desire to have a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. Father, so do we, and we know that sin has messed that up, and Father, help us today. Uh, as Dave teaches, as Dave talks this uh, evening, that Father, we will understand you in a greater way and it will lead us ultimately into a deeper spirituality. So thankful for people like Dave and Beth who dedicated themselves first to you and then to your kingdom in trying to help us to continue uh, to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Above all, we're grateful for the death of Christ because it meant life for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Well, it's great to be in Ottawa, Canada. Whoa. Uh, so, yes, this is why I've been in Canada twice. We went to our conference in Toronto. And uh, this is our, like, First time being here and just getting around and meeting people, and so it's been fantastic. Um, I don't have a lot of time to cover what I want to cover, so what I'm going to do, we're going to have three sessions together, one today and two tomorrow, and we explain what's going to happen in each. This is going to be called Toward a Deeper Spirituality, and this this is the kind of message you want to, if you, if you would all take notes, you're going to want to take notes. Not to follow everything I say, because I'll share everything that's up here. I'll give you the PDFs. But what this is going to do, it's going to spark for you ideas. That's the hope of where you can go in your own journey. Okay. That's the hope today. I just want to inspire you to do more in your relationship with God. Okay. Okay. So that's today's goal. Tomorrow in the sermon, we're going to do an overview of the book of Jonah. And we're going to do kind of a deeper Bible study in the book of Jonah for the sermon. So if you want to read Jonah in the morning before you come to church, it would benefit you. Okay. Then afterwards, I'm going to do a lesson on fear in our discipleship. Okay. The fear that we deal with as disciples. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's kind of three totally different things. But today is teaching. So um, in that, I need to know how many of you have been Christians for less than 10 years? Less than 10 years. Less than 5 years? Okay, over 10? Most. Over 20? Okay, anyone over 30? Living like it? Or... Living like it. Living like it. Living like it. You know, we sent him away. And the hope was you control him. Yes. <laughs> that you've given up. Yeah. As we did. But there's a no return policy. Yeah. <laughs> so I am like, I'm fascinated he's letting me speak this much to you because I have a lot of dirt on uh, Tony Singh. Oh, oh, We've known them a long time. Oh, oh, so tomorrow we'll get into some of that. Yes. Yes. You know, we need to have a spiritual day first. Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm also going to spread out telling you about us and our journey and my own story and our family because we just don't have the time to do it all at once and we'll be a different there'll be different people I'm sure here tomorrow. Uh, I do want to just show you really quickly this is our current family. Um, Beth and I've been married now for 27 years. We uh, our oldest daughter Hannah got married two years ago. Uh, that's our son-in-law now Tacho Anastasio Coronado or Tacho like nachos with a T. Yes. Um, so he's from a border town in Texas, Mexico. So he grew up on a border town. Okay. And um, we love having him in the family. He's amazing. So Hannah and Tacho serve in the full-time ministry in San Antonio. They're campus ministers and both finished their degrees and now are in the ministry. And our younger daughter, so our dream was always to have a biological daughter and adopt a little girl from India. That was our dream. Okay. And God fulfilled that dream. Maddie is now 21 years old. She was born in New Delhi. And she is just graduated from university wow. with a medical humanities degree. She wants to do something with medicine. We're not sure what yet. So that's our family. And I'll tell you more about that um, tomorrow, about our journey and our own story. But I want to tell you what we're going to do today. So my goal is to broaden how you see the scriptures today. 
We're going to do all this in one hour. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We're going to kind of cover a lot of ground and not go very deep, but just go a little wide today. I also want to help you figure out ways to deepen your spiritual life. One of the great challenges for me that drove me to go back to school was that I felt unaware of ways to go deeper spiritually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I read the Bible for 26, 7 years, and you know, you ever get in a rut where you just feel like, man, things are the same, I'm hearing the same sermons, I'm in kind of the same rut. I needed to expand my view, and I hope to do that for you today. Okay. And, and in that, kind of expand your awareness of what's really out there. When you consider that for 2,000 years, people have been walking with God, yeah. well, more than that, yeah. with Christ, yeah. Yeah. we have some amazing people to study, to learn from, to draw from throughout the last 2,000 years. And we're going to tap into some of that here today. Amen. Now, here's the warning. So I'm working on a PhD, which means I've spent the last two years in a basement. <laughs> Reading and writing, that's really what I do. I don't see people much anymore. So this is an experiment today. I'm learning how to talk to people about what I'm learning. And part of what's challenging is, you know, you dig into these deep wells, but then, you know, people, when you come and talk about it, you have to learn how to communicate in a way that makes sense because they're not spending all the time you are with that. So there's some room for you. There you go. Okay, so... Um, so just be, be, you know, bear with me. My wife is, she's constantly nudging me. You need to explain that. You need to, you know, so I'm okay with, if you have a question, raise your hand. If something doesn't make sense. If you're not familiar with the word, just tell me. Okay. Um, so just so you know, cause I always get asked this question. I have, I have two years of full study that I've done. I've got one more year of coursework, then a year of comprehensive exams. Then I start my dissertation. I'm hoping to be done by 2022. And then the question everyone always asks, then what? And you can pray about that. We have no idea. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we don't know what's going to happen. Okay, so what I do want to do is I want to explain the relationship between the Bible, theology, and spirituality. Because this is where we have to start to understand what is spirituality. And it, you can't really answer that question until you look at, well, what is theology? Okay, so can anyone tell me... What they think theology is. What, what would you say is theology? Simple definition. Yeah. Study of God. Great. The study of God. Okay. The study of religion. The study of religion. Great. It's more specific, I think. Study of God and everything else, but more on the scriptures. The Bible. Oh, well, theology. there's a part of theology yeah, that covers scripture. So yeah. we're going to get into that. Okay. But I think the general, you're right. Studying religion, studying God. God, Theo, means God. So the study of God is probably the simplest. That's a great definition. So uh, Avagrius, who was a very famous theologian, said this. And I think a lot of times the concept of theology can scare us as Christians. My goal is to unscare you, right? To help you realize this is not a scary thing. If you are a theologian, then you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, you are a theologian. And what, what does he mean by that? So if you're practicing your faith, if you go and read the Bible and try to figure out what it means, you're already a theologian. <clears throat> you're studying God, you're taking the scriptures, and you're trying to make sense of them in your life. Mm -hmm. That makes you a theologian. Yeah. Now, theology has many parts, mm -hmm. and all its parts are many. Yeah. And so what I want to do is even explain all the ways you're already a theologian. Okay. So for example, how many of you believe in the Trinity? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God, yeah. but not the same manifestation of God, right? Yeah. And we could get in all kinds of discussions of what that means. But that makes you a Trinitarian theologian. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Bible, does the Bible ever say anything about the, the Trinity? No, it doesn't. It, doesn't. it doesn't say it. It talks about the Father, and it talks about the Son, and it talks about the Holy Spirit. It never pulls it together in any kind of description. So when we piece that together, when we look at this passage and add that passage and add that passage and make sense of it, then we become theologians. Okay, so that's that's Trinity theology. How about, do any of you know, if someone were to come and ask you, how do you become a Christian? How many of you think you could tell somebody how they become a Christian? Okay, so what is that? That is soteriology. That's the theology of conversion. 
Because in the Bible, is there any book that you can open up to and just read and it explains how to become a Christian? No. 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 There's different examples. There's different parts of the theology that get explained in certain places, right? So we have to take scriptures and make sense of them, and then we're doing soteriology. Okay. What do we believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Yes. Yes. They're doing good, Tony. They believe that. Bro, I've been teaching some good stuff. You're teaching good stuff. Yes, yes. yes. Was Jesus also fully human? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's called Christology. Yeah. Yeah. That's a theology, an aspect of theology where we see God, fully God, fully human. That's an integral part of our faith. Okay? And we could go on. You get the point, right? If, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? How does the Spirit work? That's pneumatology. Do we believe in church? Yep. Well, you're here. Yep. Does the church function as a community where they have leaders and different right. gifts play different roles? And we, yeah. you know, yeah. that's ecclesiology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, it's not scary. Sometimes people that are smart like to throw fancy words out because they, you know, then they feel better about it. It's not scary. Right. Do you believe me? Yes. I'm looking at you. <laughs> yes. He doesn't okay. believe me. Okay. Talk, talk to him specifically. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. So similarly, uh, ex- eschatology is we believe Jesus is coming back for us. Amen. Yeah. That's eschatology. We believe that God created the universe, the world we live in, and he constantly works to regenerate it. That's cosmology. And we understand as human beings that we are sinful. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Yes. 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 Ah, yes. 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 Um, so anthropology is the study of man and its relationship to God. Okay. Very good? Yeah. Any questions about that? That's theology. Okay. So how? So we take the Bible, we develop doctrines, theologies, and then we have to do something with it. Is it good enough to just sit back and know these things? No. 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 So this is one of the great strengths of our church is we say... You can't just believe, you have to live. Yes. You must do, that is spirituality. Spirituality is the lived experience. Mm-hmm. It's the what you do with your faith. That's what we study when we talk about spirituality. Okay. So, in our personal life, we can say spirituality is the life lived in relationship to God. So, when I say, well, what is Tony saying spirituality? I would look at, how does Tony live in relationship to how he sees God? Now, is Tony's spirituality different than Melanie's? Yes. 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 It is, because there's an individuality. Is it better? better? (laughs) (laughs) It's not. The trainer said no. No. I'm really surprised you put up with him this long, but that's it. He's good. Um, He's good. He's good. good? good. So, one of the things that we need to to automatically upfront accept and celebrate is that we're all different. Mm -hmm. The way I connect with God is different than the way my wife connects with God. The way my spirituality plays out is different than the way hers plays out. And we're going to develop that here as we go on a little bit. So what I do academically, just so you know, is we take all these different – we look at spirituality from the theological side, the historical side, the psychology side. And we tie all those things in together to understand what – how do people live out their faith? So that's what we study. Okay. So, there is something that's becoming really big today in our world, and it's this idea of being spiritual but not religious. Is that happening in Canada? Are people yes. talking about that? No. I want to be spiritual yes. but not religious. Yes. Now, there's a lot of reasons why. We call them espionars, right? That's the, the highly technical term. <laughs> uh, right? So, what does that mean? They want to be spiritual but not religious. Well, it depends where they're coming from. The reality is a lot of people have been hurt. By church, oh, yes. Talk about they have like. wounds. They're, they've had bad experiences. They've been damaged, and so people in that situation often want a relationship with God, but they don't know how to do it in a way that they've traditionally understood. <coughs> but there's another thing that's happening in our individualistic modern world, which is, I want to do what I want to do. And I don't really want to concern myself with others. Mm -hmm. And so if I focus just on me and God, then that's really all I care about. And being part of a Christian community or a faith community is not important to me. 
Now, I think that's a different motivation, right, than being wounded. But that ties into something that is important for us to understand. Is that okay? Can you just have a relationship with God without other people? No, 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 no. no, no. Absolutely not. I mean, how do you practice forgiveness if there's no one to forgive? Mm. <laughs> the true test of our Christianity <laughs> is love, yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. You know, it's that engagement. It's that one another. I mean, yeah. anybody can be a Christian when no one's around them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a different story when you engage people. So when we look at Christian history in the last 2,000 years, what do we call a heresy? Heresy is when a part of the truth is expounded to be or portrayed as the whole truth. So in this case, I can have a relationship with God. I don't need a church. I don't need a community. I don't need other people. Well, that would be a Christian heresy. You're saying part of the Christian truth, it is part of the truth. You have a relationship with God. That is true. But that's only part of the truth. It's the same thing as in the early church then saying Jesus was fully God. He wasn't necessarily fully human. Mm -hmm. No, that's heresy. Mm -hmm. He was fully God and fully human. Well, okay, he was clearly human, but maybe he wasn't really God. Maybe he was just a prophet. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not our faith. Yeah. We have to embrace the whole aspect of our faith or we consider it heresy. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right, so when we talk about spirituality and, and people that write about spirituality, can you think of any authors or people that you would look to? Who writes about the lived experience? Who has written about that that you know or have read? Or can you Rick think of Warren. People? Rick Warren. Okay, great. Anyone else? Max Licato. Max San Antonio. Man, right there. You know, he comes out of the same tradition we do. He comes out of the Churches of Christ. Right? Okay. Kit Cummings? Mm -hmm. Kit Cummings? Yeah, I would say he writes about spirituality. Have any of you ever heard of uh, Richard Foster? Yeah. yeah. No. Anybody read Celebration of Discipline? Yeah. No. Okay, that's on the book list. And as you see, uh, we're going to get to that at the end. There's a number of books that we're going to, for those of you that want to dig. Um, this guy was a breakthrough. So just to give you a little taste of history here of, of where... What's happened in this field? The Protestant Reformation that took place. Does anybody know when Luther and the Reformation? When did that happen? Around 1490. Yeah, 16th yeah. century, yeah. early 16th century. Yeah. Okay. And from there, the Protestants mm -hmm. became the Lutherans mm -hmm. and the Calvinists, right? And so, what what did they end up discussing a lot about? Bible yeah, and doctrine. Theological. Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine, the theology, the theology, the theology, the theology. And so what became really a big deal for Protestants was theology and scripture. Yeah. Yeah. How much got talked about was spirituality, how you live your life. Well, it actually kind of got left behind in the conversations for, for centuries. Because we were fighting about this church formed over this and that church about that and the, it's all about their theologies. Yeah. One of the neat things about the International Churches of Christ, in which we're part of, is that we came along and said, yeah, it's about what you believe, but it's really about how you live. Mm -hmm. It's about what you're doing with your life, your discipleship, your active, practical life. Like, well, How are you loving people? How are you getting along with one another? So, so I think that's one of the great strengths of who we are as a culture. But what's really neat about Richard Foster, the Catholics, while we were over here fighting about all these doctrines and theologies, the Catholics kept focusing on theology, but how we live, how we live. How, and I'm not talking about the average Catholic you bump into on the street. I'm talking about as a core, what their theologians and their what their academics were doing. They, they held both in tension. Well, Richard Foster comes along and he, he studies his whole life. He gets a PhD and he studies these this 2,000 years of history of people that have really walked with God in great ways, and he said, I want to write a book that will appeal to a Protestant audience and recover the spiritual practices of old. And he broke it down into these, you know, 12 disciplines. If you haven't read this book, it's, a, it's one of my highly recommended books. But our inward life, meditation, prayer, fasting, and Bible study. Our outward life, Living simply, in so having understanding solitude, submission, service, and of course, corporately, we have disciplines we practice. We confess to one another, we worship together, we 
get advice from one another. We celebrate our faith together. And he captured all these ancient practices and wrote them in a way that people go, that's really cool. We need to talk more about this. And he opened up the door for this discussion of spirituality. So he's important. Have you ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Yes. Yeah. No. yes. He was a, a German sure. uh, theologian, young man, died at 38, 37 or 38. He was killed by um, Hitler's regime. But he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And what the reason why that was so significant is that, again, all these, especially German theologians, were arguing about doctrine and theology. And he said, yeah, grace is important, but it's costly grace, not cheap grace. We have to live our life in a way that we show we're grateful for God's grace, not just say it's the grace of God that saves me. Yeah. That was a significant breakthrough book. How about C.S. Lewis? Anybody heard of him? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a great writer of spirituality. How about Martin Luther King? Now, you may not automatically think, I mean, you can see some of your faces, wait, spirituality? Well, if spirituality is putting into practice Christian principles, he was addressing some of the most significant social justice issues that were plaguing the United States and in a way that broke through where we started treating with one another in more Christian ways the way we should be treating one another, yeah. right? And I think he's one of the great spiritual influences in the United States. Yeah, yeah. We have a similar, you know, example in South Africa. Um, after apartheid, for you know, when Mandela got out of prison, and we have a very divided white and black and Indian culture, they established this idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Let's actually resolve our conflict using Christian principles, the idea of forgiveness and reconciliation changed the South African culture. It prevented, I believe, a civil war. Yeah. Um, so, so sometimes we see practices and influences by how people live their life that shape the way culture moves. Okay? So when we talk about spirituality, what are the important things that we look at? These are kind of the big, the big ticket items. Okay. Primary characteristics, meaning if we were to describe who we are in the International Churches of Christ, what are the first things you think about? Who are we? What do we, what, 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 what stands out about us? What do we believe? What do we do? Okay, discipling relationships. We believe in one another relationships, that we should be involved in each other's lives, and whatever that means to you, but, but scripturally, that's an important aspect of our faith, right? What else is something we deeply believe in practicing? Main group uh, <clears throat> uh, relationships and using the group as a, as, a, as a tool to build uh, individuals up. Okay. All right. The importance of our – I mean, we put community very high. Yeah. yeah. Right? We believe the church, the, the community, what we're doing, how we do it collectively, which, again, in our modern world, in a very individualistic society – our emphasis on church life is counterculture. Yes. I mean, most people go to church. When they go to church, they whether they're there or not, nobody knows. Yes. Whether they're really pulled in or connected or part of family. Can, I mean, there are examples of people that, that are connected. I'm not saying that as a blanket yes. statement. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying this is one of the strengths of ours. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Making disciples. Making disciples. We believe in this role we play in seeing the message spread to the rest of the world. And not just the message, but the transformation, the conversion process, yeah. so that we're calling people to the same commitment we understand to be yeah. right. Not just yeah. believe it, but live it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's a really special, unique aspect of our spirituality. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Love. Love, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That love connection. And the Bible is the standard where... Yes. Yeah. Scripture yeah. is a really integral part. Okay, so now... So those are some of our primary characteristics. Now that's we call that we call that an active sorry an active practical spirituality. Our spirituality, you you see how we live our life. We're very active. We're very engaged. That's what we're good at. Now there's other types of spirituality, the contemplative type of spirituality. Oh, what group would you say practices more the contemplative life? Nuns. Nuns. <laughs> Well, now they can do both. Yeah, There's a lot of, true. and I would say maybe even monks more than nuns, but nuns are 
both, but yeah, the, the monastic life. Yeah. Those that have decided to pull out of society and devote themselves to prayer and study. Right? That would be considered more of a monastic type of spirituality. Okay, so you get the point, right? There's different characteristics. <laughs> How do we view our relationship with God? That's a defining characteristic. Okay, so for us, how would the ICOC define their relationship with God? We believe it's an individual yeah. relationship with God. But what does it usually come when someone says, How's your relationship with God going? What does it usually come down to for us? Quiet time. Quiet time, Quiet time which means Bible study and prayer, right? Yeah. Now, are there other ways to connect with God? Exactly. We're going to get into that, right? So, this is one of the areas that I think we have to grow in. Yeah, yeah, it's Right? We've got to really grow. What does that mean? What does intimacy look like? How do we connect with God? What is a relationship besides yeah. just read your Bible and pray? Is there more to that? Yeah. All right, we'll get into that. Okay, how would we talk about our relationship with our community? Well, when you think of engaging the community as a Christian in our fellowship, what's the first thing that usually comes to mind? Hope worldwide. Hope worldwide. Good. And reaching out, share your faith. I mean, you know, we share faith, we share faith, we share faith. We're going to make disciples. And is that good? Well, I'm not here to say good or bad. We're just saying that's who we are, right? There are rooms for us. There's room for us to grow there too. Okay, great. Um, relate so within our. I'm sorry, I jumped to outside community. Within our community, we already talked about our one another relationships. What is our mission? Make disciples. We know that. Okay. Are there other groups of Christians that have other missions? Yes. Yeah, sure there are. Okay, so that's a defining characteristic. And what do we value? What What's a charism? Does anybody know what a charism is? It's a spiritual gift. Charis is the is the um, Greek word for grace. And so when we talk about grace, we talk about charis. Charism is the gifts, the grace given that manifests in different ways, right? God's grace has been manifest in different ways. That's Ephesians chapter 2. It talks about that. So what do we value? What spiritual gifts tend to be valued in our church? <laughs> I, I, okay, I'm glad that came up. Is obedience a charism? No. It is not. It shouldn't be. It's not. A charism is a spiritual gift, something that you've been given that is different than somebody else. So you may be good at something spiritually that someone else may not be as good at. Preaching. No, we would expect all Christians to have grace and forgiveness. Maybe compassion. Maybe compassion. Service. How about we? So, what are the spiritual gifts we read about in the scriptures? Leadership. Yes. Do we value leadership? Yeah, absolutely. How about song leading? Does everybody have that gift? Yes. Yes. Have you heard Tony try to sing? Everybody does not have this gift. <laughs> this is fun for me. No. <laughs> so, so some of us have the gift of preaching, some teaching, some leadership, some administration, some song leading, some serving, some encouraging, giving. All right, giving. How about financial giving? Is that yeah. gift? Yeah. Yeah. Some people are gifted to make money, oh, yeah. and they should be using their gift. For the kingdom, as we all should be using our gift for the kingdom. Okay, so we tend to value leadership's been big on our list, right? Song leading, um, Bible leadership can include like Bible talk leadership, church leadership. Mm -hmm. But are there other gifts that maybe we need to grow and appreciate? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, we can agree on that. All right. So that's kind of how we look at spirituality. So what influences a spirituality? What makes us who we are? Why are we the way we are? Why is the ICOC, the International Church of Christ, that started in the early mid or mid to late seventies, and has now kind of become our? We've got our own culture. We've got our own. Like if you walk into a church in the ICOC in other places around the world, you walk in and you connect, right? Yeah. So what is it that influences the spirituality? Well, there's always certain scriptures that define a culture, a spiritual culture. What are the scriptures that define our culture? 
What are the ones that you, like you're going to hear, if you listen to ten sermons, there are certain scriptures. And it's not come out of Esther. And it's not come out of the And I'm telling you, it's not in Nehemiah. So what scriptures are you going to hear that are defining for us? Okay. Like if this was Family Feud and we'd be, you know, like, number one answer. First Corinthians 13. Yes. 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 Acts 2. Acts 2. Yes. 38 to 42. Or Acts 2, 42. For yes. they devoted themselves yes. to the apostles' yes. teaching, to the fellowship, and to prayer. How about Luke 9? Oh, yeah. 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 Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, we yeah. must. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. you know the scripture. Oh, Luke 14. Oh, yeah. Right? You've got to count the costs. Yeah. yeah. So these are defining for us. So when we look at other spiritualities, part of what I want us to do today, part of my hope is to also appreciate that just because we're the way we are, doesn't mean we can look with judgment on others. That are different. Whoa. Thank you. I still have 30 minutes. So. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Have you ever heard of Francis of Assisi? Yes. 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 Okay. So Francis. He's here. Francis is here. <laughs> You're here. You're here. <laughs> must be really old by now. <laughs> Eight hundred range. Yeah. So Francis. Francis was a monk and had a real problem with what he saw in his context, and he felt like there was too much money being used to benefit those that were in spiritual leadership. And he was deeply moved by the passage of Scripture where Jesus says, Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. And so he decided to build an entire community around that passage. We're going to give up everything. We're going to live on nothing. We're going to serve those that are in need. And would you say that's spiritual? Mm. Oh, yeah. It's it's spiritual. Now, that community got built around that passage. Our community may get built around Matthew 28. Other communities are built around other passages. It doesn't mean that one's better than the other. It means that we tend to focus on, like, okay, for example, when we look at salvation, I, I, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just trying to help us understand. If you look at in Matthew's gospel, what is, there's a whole chapter devoted to judgment. What chapter? How does God judge in Matthew's gospel? Matthew 25. Sheep and the goats. According to Matthew's gospel, there is one test that it will all come down to. How did you treat those in need? If you loved those that were in need, if you gave food and, and shelter and clothing to those in need, then you will be welcome into the kingdom of heaven. And if you have not, you won't be. That is the judgment in Matthew's gospel. Now, is that the one we tend to preach? No. 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 Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with us. I'm saying we have to understand there's a lot more to Scripture than the small parts that we sometimes focus on. And part of us growing up is we get to expand our view of what Christian, what the Christian life looks like, how we live our Christian life, and appreciate those that have focused on other things. Does that make sense? Okay. So, Scripture shapes us. Our theology shapes us, yeah. which we've kind of covered. Our culture shapes us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Does it affect us that we were a movement born in the United States of America? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Deeply. Yeah. Yeah. Deeply affects us. It affects the way we see things sociologically, yeah. mm-hmm. philosophically, and politically. I mean, in two, and I, I know so, if any of you were in the United States, and I don't know how this carried over because I wasn't here. But in 2003, we had a little blip in the radar. A little something happened. Yeah, what? <laughs> yes. I don't know what it was. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. that that was shattering. Yes. You know. But you know what was interesting for Americans? A lot of Americans immediately, when their system blew up, what did they immediately go to? Democracy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We need to build a church like a democracy. We need to start voting. Wow. Well, why would that be? Because that's what they knew. Mm-hmm. Right? 
So culture shapes the way you see your Christian faith. And I think, you know, we don't always realize how deep that is in us. So yeah. another example would be the American dream. Mm-hmm. The American dream in Christianity, if you were to look at them objectively, do they really fit hand in hand really well? No. 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 The Christian faith and no. go build your house and make your fortune and no. think no. about yourself and pursue no. your passion. And they don't. And yet sometimes as Christians, we don't realize how much we can conflate what the world is telling us and the way we see scripture or our faith. Yeah. And so that's why this is important for us to learn. We've got to be able to separate and look at those things. Okay? Um, so let's talk now. I, I want to spend a little bit more time on this relationship with God peace because I think this is one of our biggest needs to grow. Amen. When we talk about a relationship with God, um, there's a lot of components to it, just like there is in marriage. So Beth and I have been married for 27 years. There's a lot of dynamics. I couldn't just tell you that our marriage comes down to we have dinner together every night and we have a good conversation before bed. I mean, and you think about our relationship with God, that's often what we do. Bible study and prayer. We sit down and read the Bible and we talk, we communicate, we pray. Well, that's true, but there's a lot more going on. If you're walking with Jesus... There's a lot more happening, right? So scripture becomes a really important part of that. And there's a way that we, we're going to talk a little bit. Have any of you heard of Lexio Divina? Mm-hmm. Yep. Melanie? Stuff I know has. Lexio is a way of reading scripture that has been around since origin, third century. It's been used for 1,700 years. And we're going to, well, I'll share a book or two with you. You can read about that. But there's a lot of ways for us even to deepen how we see scripture how to read it more spiritually, less historically, Mm -hmm. less, you know, on the surface of things. So that's important. But our relationship with God also has to do with how we worship. And for some, that's in singing, and that's in fellowship, and that's... But worship is a demeanor. It's not a Sunday service. Worship is something that should happen in our constant... What is that? <laughs> it's a motion detection. It's motion. I'm not moving enough. Okay. It's motion over there. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Somebody can stand over here and do some jumping. Yeah. <laughs> they the lights on. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. So um, when we think about worship, I think you know one of the things that that we have to grow in is understanding, yes, we come together and we worship together, but worship is a demeanor which follows us all day, every day. Paul says pray continuously. You ever think about that? Like, what does that mean? Pray continuously. Okay, we'll get to some of that too later. Um, Which ties into prayer, worship, and prayer are very connected. Grace. What is grace? How would you define grace? Uh, letting people make mistakes and be okay with it that nobody's perfect. Okay. It's a form of grace. It's a form mm-hmm. of grace? Mercy. I know it's, it's a different word, but that's always but when I think grace, I think mercy. Okay, let's well, and we'll, let's talk about the difference between grace and mercy. That they're, they're, those are important relationships. Yeah. Okay, I think it's defined as God's unmerited favor towards humankind. Okay. God's unmerited favor. Yeah. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Right? Those are all parts of grace. Mm-hmm. So let, let's think about grace as gift. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's think about grace as being given something you don't deserve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the fact that you're breathing right now, is that grace? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that you woke up this morning. <coughs> grace. Yeah. The fact that there will be food on your table tonight. Grace. Yes. Yes. The fact that you have a relationship with another human being. Oh, grace. Yes. The fact that God loves us. Yeah. The fact that he loved us before we did anything. Yeah. The fact that he loves us after we did something. <laughs> right? Grace. 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 Gift. 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 God is, God is the giver. God is... Have you ever heard of the word fecund? Fecundity? Yes. This idea of, of unending life. This unending flourishing life. 
God is giving so much all the time that we can't contain the gift. Right. Yeah. Grace is everywhere. Grace is constant. Grace is... Yeah. And so we've got to... This is something we need to grow in our understanding. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. Because we get really caught up in the if I'm not living a certain way and if I'm not behaving a certain way and if I didn't sin and if I did oh, sin and how does God feel about me and how does that change everything? It's not... That's not true. None of that's true. That's it's, right. grace. Yeah. it's grace. It's yeah. grace. It's yeah. grace. It's grace. Anyway, that's another sermon. Like I said, this is a broad overview today. Yeah. Okay, sacrament. Do we believe in sacrament? Yeah. Yes. 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 Take a vote. At least two. <laughs> two. <laughs> At least. What is sacrament? Yes. Now this is sacrament. These are all capital letters, but I'm going to say sacrament small c, not sacrament big c. Yes. What is sacrament? Sacrament is the idea of a ritual place where we connect with the divine. A special place. Something sacred. Now, in our culture, in, in the ICOC, where would we say are special places, special rituals where we connect with the divine? How about baptism? Is that a special one for us? A sacred ritual of a special practice. Communion, oh, yes. it's a sacred yeah. place. Now, I would argue we need to do, we need to become more sacred, more sacramental with our communion service. Understand more and more what that is. But it is something we've held on to and practiced, and, I, yeah. and we do it every week. And I think that's important. Or giving. Uh, giving can be sacramental. Um, so sacrament is this idea of a special connection, of presence with God, often celebrated in community, sometimes individually. I think marriage can be, you know, so that's why some churches are built around a sacramental system that they see that's the primary way of connection. Sacrament becomes an important manifestation of that connection. Um, but we do have sacrament. I think sacrament's important because who is, what, when Jesus told us how to celebrate coming together, what did he tell us to do? To remember him. He created sacrament. As one of the most important lasting ordinances that he left us with. He created sacrament. Okay, how about nature? Now, when we were talking about grace, somebody said forgiveness that God gives humans. Does God gift the rest of creation? Yes. Oh, yes. Give God gifts every aspect of what's living around us, right? So nature becomes a real manifestation of God's grace for us to look and see and appreciate and understand. Uh, so that's fantastic. Now, let's get down here to this really important one. Down. What in the world Whoa. is mysticism? Whoa! It's a mystery. <laughs> it is a mystery. It is. Okay. So, how many of you ever heard of the word mysticism? Most of us. How about Christian mysticism? Does anybody know what it is? What is Christian mysticism? So let me tell you when, when I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna define it and we're gonna talk about it and I'm gonna encourage you to practice it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Oh. okay. So when we talk about mysticism, here's here's what we mean. This is one of my professors. I love his definition. He says the mystical or mysterious mystical element in Christianity is that part of its belief and practice that concerns the preparation for the consciousness of and the reaction to what can be described as the immediate or direct presence of God. When do you prepare for, orient yourself toward, and put yourself into the presence of God? Wow. Worship. When you're going through Prayer. hardship. And worship. 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 Hard time. Prayer. 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 Quiet time. Silence. 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 Yes. So you're all Christian mystics. <laughs> so what I would actually, and there's different definitions of Christian mysticism, but the practical one that I really want us to think about is the intimate part of our relationship with God. The intangible, the part you can't really describe so well. Like when you're trying, when you think about you and God and that specialness you share, that, that intimacy, that... That place that nobody sees, that nobody else knows, the place where you connect, where you have that, that and I, I love the word intimacy, I think intimacy really communicates about Christian mysticism. It's not just about reading your Bible, is it? No. It's much deeper. 
Yeah. It's not about going through a prayer and just saying to our Father. It's what's going on in your heart, mind, and soul as you're praying, when you're connecting, yeah, yeah. how you're orienting yourself. But isn't mysticism as well things like understanding that God became man, that Jesus took, you know, that the Godly became flesh, that it's beyond our comprehension. It's, it's a mystery, it's a, it's a miracle. It's a, isn't that part of mysticism as well? I'm going to separate that out and call that one of the mysteries of our faith, okay. which you're right. We have a lot of mysteries of our faith. <laughs> Paul talks about the mysteries of our yep. faith. Yep. But mysticism particularly is the practice of the relationship dynamic that's the intangible part, the intimate part, the closeness. Okay, And so part of our challenge is we don't know how to talk about it very well. We haven't developed a language. We're not used to it. We don't, like how do we talk about intimacy with God? Well, people have been talking about it for a long time. We just don't always... We haven't read them. We don't know about them. So we're going to, again, I'm going to hopefully connect you with some of that today. Does that make sense yeah. so far? Yeah. Okay, so I do want to put in a little caution here. Um, and I have to do this because of who we are in the ICOC. Yeah. You know what our first concern? Some of us that tend to be more conservative, more fundamental about how we see our Christian faith. We get scared about, wait a minute, are you saying that we're just going to start focusing on our experience with God and this intimacy with God. What about the lost world? What about the... What about the yeah, yeah, I know. The real test of a true mystical experience, a true mystic, is someone who has those experiences, but it transcends into they love their neighbor more. Wow. Right? I mean, we when we're close to God, we love people more. Isn't that what the scriptures teach yeah. us? Yeah. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other and be a Christian. Wow. You yeah. have to have both. So... The idea, and the problem is, and we'll talk about this tomorrow afternoon, when we focus too much on just loving our neighbor and we aren't focused on the intimate part with God, we run out of gas. Yes. <laughs> the well gets dry. Yep. The living water no longer flows. Yeah. Right? And so what I'm talking about is what Jesus says, come to me, for I am the well of life, the spring of life. I am the, what is he saying, John? I am the bread of life. I am the, so all those things Jesus says, he's talking about, there's some kind of spiritual food here that you need. Okay? Now, is this part of our tradition? Somewhat. We haven't always talked about it that way. Does anyone know who the founders of our movement are? Who are the founders of our movement? Okay, good. Two great answers right there. And they're two of our founders. Kim McKean was one of our founders, yeah. specific to the International Churches of Christ. But before that, we come out of the Stone Campbell movement. Right. Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell. Did you guys know that? Yes. Okay, let me show you something that Thomas Campbell, Thomas and Alexander were a father-son. Uh, this is how Thomas Campbell described what we're calling mysticism. What can be more blissful than the exercises of heaven, namely the contemplation, admiration, adoration, and worship of God? What more desirable than the enjoyment of the divine presence? Now that's one of our founders. Okay? That's great. So what I want to touch on here for the last few minutes that we have together is I want to go to the mystical gospel. Of the four gospels, which one would you say tends to be the mystical gospel? John. 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 Great answer. John. Right. John, why? Why do you say that? Because the way it's written. The way it's written? Yeah, it's different. Same? It's, very, it's different from the other three gospels. That's why it's very... Um, Okay, great, yes. It really promotes the divinity of Christ. Okay. From the very beginning. Right, so where Matthew, Mark, and Luke really start with, you know, and and two of them start even with Jesus all the way born of a woman, right? I mean, we're dealing with the very human side. Where Where does Jesus come from in John's Gospel? In the beginning. In the beginning. But he just kind of appears out of heaven, right? He just becomes the word became flesh. I mean, there's no woman involved. 
There's no birth narrative. Yeah. No. He just comes from heaven. Yeah. So you're right. So so John John has one. Yes. What? Um, Absolutely. So what the different gospel writers do is they focus on different aspects of Jesus and his life. So where Luke and Matthew focus on the birth of Jesus coming from a woman, they're focusing on the human side of Jesus' existence. Where John focuses on the divine birth of Jesus, that he comes from heaven. Great question. Okay, good. All right, so let's touch on John's gospel here in a little bit. And I, for those of you that have Bibles with you, we're going to look at John 4, particularly as an example of what I'm talking about. So we call John's gospel the mystical gospel for many, many reasons. But you're right. John, John is not concerned about the same things Matthew, Mark, and Luke are. So one of the things I want to challenge you to start doing differently or not doing is to stop conflating the Gospels. Now, what does that mean? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by four different people with four different motifs, focuses, for a reason. That's right. And part of what we tend to do as Christians is we just think of Jesus as, you know, the, the, the story that's kind of pieced together, that it's all kind of, well, he... And we don't pick up all the specific things that are unique to the gospel. So one way that you can grow in your understanding of Jesus is read gospels in silos, right, separately. Think about them. just what is Matthew saying about Jesus? What is John saying about Jesus? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to learn new things about Jesus if you think about it that way. Okay. okay, so in John's gospel, there are no miracles. There are signs. Now, they may be the same thing that Luke or... You know, Mark would say is a miracle, but John doesn't call them miracles. Why would he call them a sign and not a miracle? If it's the mystical gospel. What's he concerned about? What does a sign do? It points, it points, it points you to something else. A sign points you to something else. A sign is not about the sign. I mean, when you pull up to a stop sign, how many of you have stopped and taken a picture and marveled at the, you know, the octagon and the way it's painted and the red coloring? We don't care about that. It tells us something more important than the sign itself. That's what a sign does. So what John's concerned about is, and even says in Cana, when Jesus performed his first sign at the wedding of Cana. The first sign that he comes from someplace else. Yeah. Right? Okay, so that's important. The signs and symbols. There's a lot of symbols in John's gospel, which we can't get into that. That We have a really important theme in John's gospel of go and buy, which in John's gospel, which is true in a couple of the gospels, but the disciples are really slow. They're not so bright. They always see the physical, the literal, yeah. and Jesus is always dealing with a different reality, a transcendent, mystical, spiritual reality. And so every time Jesus asks a question, they want to go and find the answer somewhere physically. So they go and buy, let me go and buy bread. And Jesus is saying, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. What, what kind of yeast are we talking about? <laughs> no. um, because like, no you're bread. not talking about the physical yeast. I'm talking about a spiritual yeast. I'm talking about a spiritual water. I'm talking about a spirit. So Jesus is always on a different plane than the yeah. disciples. Yeah. Yeah. They want to go and buy. And Jesus is like, it's right here. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. The other thing that's interesting, in particular with Jesus' humanity, is that Jesus' humanity always represents the spiritual. When Jesus is hungry, is he hungry for food? He's not hungry for food. He's hungry for a food that his father... Right. Gives him the work to do, right? Or when he's thirsty, what is he thirsting? For water? No, he's thirsting for life to go out from him. Jesus gets life in John's gospel by giving his life to others. That's where his food is. That's where his drink is. So that's important in John's gospel as a whole. Does that make sense so yeah. far? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so when we think about them, we're going to just do this one as an example. We've got nine minutes left. Um, just as an example of the mystical realm, thinking differently, looking beyond the physical, why this is so important for us, let's consider the woman at the well. She's one of the greatest examples in the scriptures about someone who gets it. 
And she, she plays in contrast with men who don't get it. The women get it, the men don't get it. It's kind of how it works, right? It's, women tend to be more quickly spiritually in tune. Guys, we tend to take a little bit more time, right? So in John chapter 3, Jesus has this really spiritual engagement with a religious man. Who is that man? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And did life go out from Jesus because Nicodemus got it? No. No, Nicodemus stonewalled Jesus, and so Jesus is now hungry and thirsty. That's what's going on in John 3 and John 4. So in John 4, we pick up that in contrast with Nicodemus, now we have this woman who comes. The disciples have, where? Where are they? Does anyone know? They went to go and buy. They went to go and buy food. Right? And so Jesus ends up in this conversation with this woman who responds really well. One more uh, little tidbit before we get into this is um, the uh, woman, he calls her woman. There's only one other person he calls woman in John's gospel. It happened in John 2. His mother. Right. So I actually think we've got to reframe. I, I don't know what you think about the woman at the well. I think she's, she's the example, the epitome of good example. And what we often pin on her wasn't really intended. Jesus is holding her up in high honor when he says woman, like he does with his mother. Amen. Okay? Amen. So we have a lot to learn here from her. So, okay. What's happening? They're at Jacob's well. Jesus goes up to the well. How do we know it's Jacob's well? Do you remember later when she says... Hey, our ancestor, Jacob, gave us this well. Okay, so we're at Jacob's well. What tends to happen in the scriptures with men and women at wells? And what? You want to finish that? They meet up, man. You don't want to say it. Men and women and men and women in Bible stories at wells, romance happens. All right, connection, intimacy. Right, I'm not implying Jesus and the woman at the well from a, a romantic side, but there's an intimate connection that gets made here at the well. When um, how wells work is if you look back at the story of Jacob and the well, when he meets Rachel at the well, he arrives. And what in, in tradition? And I'm, I'm not expecting that you remember this, but you may. So when he comes, when do the when does the stone get pulled away from the well? When everybody's there yeah. and it's late in the day and all the sheep can be watered at once and then all but what's different is when Jesus or when Jacob comes it's about noon and does he wait for the rest? No. no. He rolls away the stone and waters the sheep like he, he's making things happen right there, right? At noon, high noon. Okay, so can I does anyone have a Bible I could borrow? Oh yeah. Is it too small? You want to make it on? Okay, here, here, here. I know, I know electronic Bibles are real Bibles. I just like the physical. Okay. So, um, so what makes Jesus tired? We talked about that. What fulfills Jesus and energizes him when life goes out from him? So let's look in at this story just briefly here. In verse 4. John 4, 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So when he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well, by the well. It was about the sixth hour. What time? What's the sixth hour? Is anyone noon. noon, right? We're at noon. Okay. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, in Jesus' language in John's Gospel, what is, let me, or will you give me a drink? What does that mean from what you've learned? Will you give me a drink? Will you let me tell you? Yeah. Will you let me give you life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where this is going. Okay. Um, okay, and what does she say? Verse 8, his disciples had gone into town too. My food going by. Okay. The Samaritan woman said to him, so here's her first, and this is what I love about the Samaritan woman. It's like her her real heart, her real objections just come out. Like yeah. she's like, okay, you're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? She doesn't 
She doesn't negate him. She wants to know. Like, how does this work? Right? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So the first thing that happens is she comes forward with the way she's prejudged the outward, the literal. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. This doesn't normally work. And what Jesus is doing in this whole interaction is he's reorienting the way she sees things. So does he engage her at that literal level? No. He turns her towards the divine. That's what he's doing. So Jesus says to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She's addressing men, women, Jew, Gentile, Jew, Samaritan. He says, I've got something bigger to give you. Okay? So then she comes with her next reaction. But sir, and we, you guys know the story well enough, right? But sir, you don't have a bucket. So now she's dealing with this humanistic, how can you provide something physically for me that you aren't prepared to provide physically? And he says, I'm not talking about physical water. Mm -hmm. um, again, he's reorienting her to think about the deeper, right. the more mm -hmm. spiritual, mm -hmm. the mystical. I have water to give that you know not of. I have water to give that will provide life, living water. Mm -hmm. And then she comes at him again. And she says, sir, I'll let, we, we won't go through all the details. Time. She says, sir, our people say that this is what true religion looks like. This is where worship should happen. Your people say this is where worship should happen. What do you say? Mm -hmm. And again, he says, true worshipers don't worship in locations. Mm -hmm. True worship happens in spirit and truth. Right? is this idea of, again, the reorientation. So what's really neat, and, and if you go back and you read John's Gospel and you think about this from a spiritual intimacy, what is John trying to get us to do? How are we trying to get our eyes off the physical world and think about the spiritual world? We have to live above this mm -hmm. plane that we get stuck in. That's the whole story of what's going on. So the disciples come. Can anyone find the verse where the disciples come back? From buying food and what happens? And they were wondering why are you with that woman? Why are you with the woman? What else? Did she give him food? Right? Because he's no longer hungry. Why is he no longer hungry? Because he's now given his life and he's now fulfilled. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the, I mean, you can read almost any story in John's Gospel and you're going to see the same thing. The physical, Jesus is trying to fix their orientation to get them to think about the spiritual. All right, now, what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time getting you towards the uh, sheets of paper you have in here. Who did not get one of these? Can I get a little? I always want to get us. Thank you. Okay, so... Have any of you come across a book by Gary Thomas or read a book by Gary Thomas called Sacred Pathways? Has anybody seen that book? Yep. Um, so part of what I want to give you here and throw at you is a lot of ways that you can take some of these concepts that I've shared with you and go with them. And one of the neat things about Gary Thomas, Gary took this idea of that we're created differently and we find different pathways to God. And he breaks it down into these real, like, kind of these nine ways that people connect differently with God. There's the naturalist, you know, who enjoys being in nature, like my wife, right? Um, happy place. That's the best happy place among the sheep, right? I mean, this is, so for me, it's big up in the mountains. I mean, I just, I find God in the mountains. Um, or the intellectual, those that like to study the law, as Ezra did. Paul was an intellectual. That's one of the ways he really found his connection to the divine. Some of us are wired like that, right? Some of us are wired more as traditionalists. We like ritual. I'm, I'm discovering more about this with me. You can ask Tony and Melanie as we've been driving around what I point out almost every time I see you. Yeah. Is I love the ancient, I love the churches, I love the, the architecture, I love the way people have built their expressions to God. Yeah. Right, That connects me spiritually, I love that. Um, that was Jacob setting up a stone, a place to go back to and remember. Right, So um, some of us really are ascetics, we like to be alone, 
We like to cut off the world, or even this is the idea of fasting. We want to disconnect ourselves and find. Uh, that was certainly John the Baptist, right? He had an ascetic approach to God. Some of us are caregivers. This is one of my wife's charisms, one of the ways she connects with God. We actually find God by loving people, serving people, meeting needs. Um, or contemplatives. Remember where Mary was when Martha was running around? Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, just yep. taking it in. She just that that, let me contemplate, let me think about, let me meditate on. Some of us are really wired that way. Or um, social justice may motivate, move, drive us. Habakkuk in his prayer. You know, the first couple of verses of Habakkuk, he's like, God, how can you stand for this injustice? Mm -hmm. um, this is, so this would be an example of a Martin Luther King or a Desmond Tutu kind of approach to spirituality. Um, some of us like the aesthetics, mm -hmm. the beauty, the, I mean, Ezekiel is, if you ever read Ezekiel, you just see the way he describes the divine yeah. Yeah. in this glorious beauty, this poetic expression, right? Yeah. Um, so some of us are like that. We love music or art or we find God in those expressions. Uh, the enthusiast, the who, who's fired up for Jesus. Some of us, you know, and that's what's funny. This was something that we used to capitalize on a lot in the past. Um, but some of us aren't that way, right? Like I don't really, you, you can't just tell me to get fired up. It doesn't work for me. I mean, some people, they get fired up. That's okay. David did. He was dancing before the Lord in his loincloth. Made his wife really mad. Yes. So, what? What I our hope today was to give you some starting places to think about these things. So I have up here um, a, pa a sacred pathway survey. If you go, man, I have no idea of those like nine things you just put up. Who I really am. We have a survey that you can take, and I'm going to send PDFs of all this stuff to Tony so you can bug him relentlessly uh, about all these things. So you may want to start there. Start with a survey and figure that out. Um, let me tell you what's on this reading list. This is just kind of an introduction to some ways of thinking about spirituality. Some six general books. The best yes is kind of positioning yourself in a way where you can receive God. Um, how you structure life in that sense. Emotional Healthy Spirituality is a book about the relationship between our spirituality and our emotional health. If you're not emotionally healthy, you're going to have a very difficult time being spiritual. And we are often limited by our emotional well-being. Um, Sabbath, that book is really an introduction to the spiritual life. We have another handout up here that's based on that, which gets into Lectio Divina, which I mentioned earlier, and some other meditative practices. Sacred Pathways, of course, is the one I just kind of zipped through the nine things. Um, if you are more the historian, you want to understand how have Christians you know, looked at spirituality through the ages... This is one of my professors, Philip Sheldrake, and he talks about the four major movements of spirituality, the monastics, the contemplatives, the social justice, and the active practicals. Where are the active practicals, right? Um, if you're interested in learning about Lexio Divina, it's a four-step process of how to connect with Scripture, how to read it spiritually. That's what that book is about, Praying Scripture for a Change. That's a great introduction book. So those are some general ones. Then um, some classic, if you like going back and looking at classic texts, there's a book on the, De the Desert Fathers. I already talked about, oh no I didn't. Devotional Classics takes excerpts of old classic spiritual texts and gives you snippets so you can go, well, let me read a little bit of Thomas Aquinas or let me read a little bit of Meister Eckhart or Julian of Norwich and go, I want to dig more into Julian of Norwich. She inspired me. Okay. Um, Celebration discipline I talked about. Intimacy with God or mysticism. Again, if you're more of the, the academic type and you want to learn, like you take a course on mysticism, that's a great book by Thomas Merton who took his priests and his monks, training them on the history of mysticism. That's what that first book is. Um, Bernie McGinn, who I quoted, same thing. He took snippets of mystical texts in that essential writings of Christian mysticism. These last two... Have any of you read The Practice of the Presence of God? Mm -hmm. Come across 17th century monk who wrote letters about how that pray continuously. How do we live in God's presence? Mm -hmm. Testament of Devotion is a text that's really special to me. It's my favorite mystical text. Um, it's written by a Quaker scholar, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested. 
Um, and then I just threw some books up here on contemporary spirituality. If you're an aesthetic person, the you know the sensate kind, um, Henry Nowen. Have anybody heard of Henry Nowen? He was a Catholic priest who's one of the the great spiritual writers of our time. He wrote a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son where he took Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son and he tells the parable through the painting. Wow. So if you're an aesthetic person, that's a great book for you. Um, anyone in their spiritual midlife may be inspired by uh, Richard Rohr's Falling Upward. It's how spirituality shifts in midlife, how we need to think differently about our spirituality in midlife. And then the last one, which I would highly, highly recommend, is my mentor. His name is Ronald Rollheiser. He writes on the spiritual journey, and he breaks it into three sections. Getting your life together is the holy longing. How we come to a spiritual unity. How we give our life away in midlife. Our kids, our jobs, our church, we're pouring ourselves out. That's the sacred fire. And then he writes, his last book is on giving your death away which he's writing that right now, and that's going to be called Insane for the Light. So that's just some places to start. So we wanted to give you, you know, things to read. Maybe you're inspired to, I need to get away and spend some time alone with God. Maybe you're the kind of person that goes, I need to really engage in giving more in different ways. But the idea is there's some places for you to start. And I went seven minutes over. I'm really sorry. Seven Seven minutes over. I told you he's awesome. Uh, so what we want to do, we'll take about 15 minutes to have a question and answer. So let's take up two minutes. If you want to fit, eat some food, nourish yourself physically, and, uh, and then we'll spend another 15 minutes. If you've got any questions, you want to ask him, where did God come from? Um, you know, uh, uh, explain uh, eternity, um, and stuff like that. He's got all the answers. Okay, yes. I always have questions. I'm sorry. Good. Yeah, that's the way that I'm so sorry. You know that, that list that you had with the nine different types of people? I yes. know one of the actors is a question about yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Really all right. So, uh, but the question is, I mean, to me that was interesting because it's a new way of looking at things. And do you look at these kinds of different things as, you know, you were talking earlier about the different gifts and the different abilities and how do they all match together and how do we grow from each other from those differences? Great question. And mm-hmm. let me say this, social activism, mm-hmm. the social justice message, the social gospel, however you want to frame that, is one of our least developed um, aspects of the spirituality in the ICC. One of the least. Yeah. And so we got to think about it a lot. What, what role will we play to change this world? How will we, if you think of Jesus' first his first comments about himself in the synagogue, what did he say? I came to <laughs> I came to break the chain of injustice. And we don't that's a that's a part of our message we don't we don't focus on. Now we've taken the position that if someone becomes a disciple of Jesus, that will break their chain. And that's true. But do we have a role in society that is more engaged in in helping people that are underprivileged, less privileged? And I think the answer is yes, and we need to figure that out. So what I would tell you, there's, yes, we've got to learn how to incorporate and learn from. There is so much great stuff written on this topic that's not on my book list. Um, Can I give you a couple thoughts here? You need to find a man named Gustavo Guterres. Guterres. He is a, he's a South American priest who wrote about the sub, the injustice happening in some of the South American countries, and he's become a voice around the world. He did a book called We Drink From Our, well, our Own Wells. We Drink From Our Own Wells. He also did, which I think you probably enjoy, um, coming out of a more Bible-centric background, he did a commentary on the book of Job. It's just called On Job. And it's a treatment of how the book of Job addresses social justice. Mm-hmm. And it's brilliant. Um, so he's a name that you want to find. And there's a couple American uh, voices that deal more with the racial injustices. Mm-hmm. But it depends on what you're really talking about. So, so it, Gustavo addresses more um, the economic injustices and the political injustices. 
but it is something that needs to be grown and developed, and I would encourage you to start reading and pursuing and learning and bring that awareness to us as a, co as a community. Okay, good question. Yes, sir. Um, I, I would like um, a quick reference or understanding so I can defend creationism. <laughs> <laughs> a book or something that can, okay. that can I help me. would be the wrong person to ask because I don't believe in it. In what? In, crea in creationism? Creationism in the sense of not evolution? Yes, that is God. Um, I would, I, that's not my personal perspective. I come from, I believe that scripture and science actually works hand in hand. And I believe that God... God drove the evolutionary process, but I think evolution personally. So I've not read a lot about creationism myself, okay. um, so I'm not the right person to ask that. But I'm sure if you were to do like a Google search on that, uh, you could find that. Okay. There's an interesting book by Lee Strobel called The Case for the Creator. Okay. And he, uh, each chapter is him talking to uh, a scientist in a different field um, and their perspective on like how their field brought them to believe in creation. So creation in the sense of hand in hand with evolution or creation well, in the sense well, of like, for example, negating? Like, he talks to cosmologists and, okay. and like they say like in, in at the moment of the Big Bang it would have been like the universe would have been flooded with light and one of the first things says let there be light, right? So it kind of is a little so bit he's like dealing what you're with saying. So that would be a good book so for you. Strobel's actually great. He's yeah, a good apologist. Okay, great. Very good. Yeah. I think that, I mean, obviously your talk was excellent. And so I'm, I'm just... Is it obvious? I mean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Excellent. Thank you. I, I, so, you know, I, I think the, um, the focus on... So I, I, the best way to say this is, okay, so, you know, in there, there were quite a bit of I guess in a sense, targeted individual reflection, or what would I okay. so In other words, you know, looking at uh, what kind of, call it personalities, or, you know, they, like, uh, social media says, or various things like that, that we're going to learn about ourselves, right? And discover that, you know, we're not just limited by the culture of the church. Mm -hmm. Right, you right. Know, there is more to us than, and Christianity, than just the culture of our church, mm -hmm. and the fact that, um, you know, doesn't make one thing better or right or mm -hmm. that, that the other. So then here's my question back to you. So then, as we go on this journey to discover, maybe this is gonna end up in Tony's uh, or whatever, but as we go on, this, uh, we're discovering about these new things about ourselves, right? We're, we still have a context of culture. Yes. So how do we you know, strategically move forward? It's a great to question. Use it's a great question. Yes, okay. Yeah. answer that so, question. <laughs> children and they were young we were very idealistic we had dreams and ideas and plans for what our family would look like and that's all great when your kids are young and you have you set off on a course as your kids get older they become more independent and they also start thinking differently than you do and good families learn together how to incorporate the individual and their growth in a way that contains family still. You still are family, but you're family that's developing and growing and maturing. Mm -hmm. And so now when my daughter or my other daughter or now my son-in-law comes with a thought of a feeling, a different perspective, it makes the family stronger. It strengthens, it, it develops, it, mm -hmm. it widens us, right? And I can't just function as the dad and say, well, this is the way it's always been and this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's not going to go so well, right? That doesn't right. help us. Same thing in the church. I think we come out of a very, we're, we are, we have to accept who we are. We are a young, yes. very, 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 very young yes. reform movement mm -hmm. yeah. who had a specific message to take to the world. Mm -hmm. And God, in that phase, I would say those first 20 years, 25 years, that message resonated in the Christian world in a way that helped a lot of people become Christians and helped us get a foothold in a lot of places around the world. And I think we have something unique to give to, to the world. But now we're growing up, 
And it changes who we are. It's going to change our identity. And so it, Tony may think he has all the answers and all the direction and all the – but that's not – that's not real. <laughs> are you, are you, you know, hey, hey, listen. These These people have an idea who I am. Don't break it. <laughs> difference you make and what seeing the kingdom of God realized here looks like wow. is, God, is way beyond Tony's sin. I'm sure. So part of it's understanding what role does Tony and what role does Melody play. Yeah. They are brothers and sister Christians. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That right. play a specific role that are coordinating the family. Yes. They don't dictate the spirituality of the family. They don't tell the family everything that's going to happen or not happen. They, they're part of the family that play a specific an important role yeah. in the family. But the family is us. Yes. The spirit is in us individually. That's right. Speaking to us individually. That's to right. become the best. I don't yeah. like the best version of us. I don't no. think that's true. No. To become what we were created to be. Yes. Yeah. With our flaws and, and weaknesses. With his mm -hmm. grace and our yeah. gifts. But what that's going to do is it's going to take our sister back here. She's going to have it away. What's your name? Zoe. Zoe? Dominique. Dominique. Dominique is going to bring an awareness, a growth, a maturity from her unique gift set and perspective. It's not going to be what Tony and Melanie think about, but they're going to need to hear what she has to say and what you have to say and what everyone else. That's what maturity starts looking like is that we start acting like spiritual adults. Yes. Yeah. That this is our church, that yeah. we are the presence of God in this community. And Tony and Melanie are helping in their gift. To coordinate that, and yeah. need that. Yeah. that. You good with that? <laughs> yeah, it's not your church, Tony. Not your church, Tony. Honestly, I'm gonna have to like write a new resume or something. <laughs> Uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, that's exactly dead on. Yeah. Dead on. Yeah. So, I, in, in the, the problem, what I was saying earlier about knowing who we are, part of growing up is accepting that we aren't that young reform movement anymore. Mm -hmm. That we are shifting now into a different stage in our own spirituality, our own development. And that's going to require all of us getting on board yeah. and stepping up and saying, what does it mean for me to be the spiritual person God made me to be? Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Yes, sir. So uh, I've been a part of church for a while, and I just kind of, as I was, like, I think for a long time we were pretty arrogant, pretty uh, pretty cocky, pretty, uh, oh, we got it all together, and everybody else is wrong, and we're right, and, um, and I thought that was pretty twisted. And um, I think uh, culturally, uh, we have to start thinking about how do we actually interact with each other and what's healthy, what's unhealthy, and uh, address things as they come up to, like even clicks and, uh, you know, just, um, you know, there's a lot of issues within a group that need to be addressed. And I think the, I don't know, I think the best way to address is in family groups and that kind of thing too, but also getting together with people that are, of your like-mindedness and stuff, and you know, and just trying to work out how we communicate, you know, and be healthy <coughs> that way. And uh, I think, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I almost call it like, uh, for me, it's like uh, religious nerdiness. Like it, it irritates me. It's just like, uh, it's like with the part where where we put ourselves in a position where we think we're better than other groups, or uh, where. What do you mean by that? Not necessarily, just I think in just even communicating uh, with each other and how we interact and, uh, you know, how we uh, see God, uh, you know, and, um, and just broaden our, our, our horizons, you know, not to be so, uh, you know, we reformed in our thinking. Yeah. You know, I just find it very, I don't know, I don't even know what I'm saying, I just, uh, it's almost more what I'm feeling than what I'm, 
it's just, I find it odd. I just find it odd that I have to act, you know, if I don't act a certain way or I don't, you know, I, you know, it's like, it's almost like it's shunned on. It's like, you know what, people just need to be allowed to be who they are and to grow in the direction that makes them strong as a Christian. And like, you know, you're talking about just, you know, you find your own little part of the world where, you know, this makes you more spiritual and go with that, you know, yeah. run with that. Yeah. And, you know, if it's nature, nature, if it's, you know, yeah. mysticism, whatever it is, right? And, you know, and, and I don't know, I just find we, we, we put people in a box for a long time. There's a certain way you're supposed to act. And if you're in a group, you know, you, you know, you mind your P's and Q's. And it was like, I don't know, I just find it kind of weird, right? Well, that's, that is, I think it's a very similar uh, sentiment from a different angle that we were just talking about, yeah. and and the goal, and, and I think you know I'm teasing Tony and Melanie here, primarily Tony, a lot today, um, but it says a lot. Tony knows all these things that I've been studying. We've got conversations for two years. Sure. The fact that he wanted me to come yeah. and talk about this is the statement of the openness to the way they are and what they want to happen here. Um, and I think it is part of growing up. We do have to get out of that kind of monolithic approach to Christianity and realize we can be united and be different. Yeah. Uniformity is not unity, right? Mm-hmm. Unity celebrates the diversity and appreciates the different gifts and who we are and how we think differently. But that takes a lot of work, too. So we have to be patient with each other in that process. And we're going to make mistakes, and people's feelings will get hurt, and we'll have a conviction, uh, an opinion that becomes a conviction that we need to do this as a church, and Tony may not respond right, or Melanie may not respond right, and you get your feelings hurt, but I thought we were going to become, and we, you know, it's going to take us, we got to find our voice and find our feet and do it respectfully, and I, I think that's part of growing up. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. Uh, if we have one more. If not, come on. Okay, question. Well, we'll have a Q&A as well um, tomorrow. Afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon. Um, Dave, thank you. Oh, we have one more. Someone you said one more. Did you want to ask me a question? Uh, yeah. Um, like, I'm just, like, I'm just starting to kind of, like, study the Bible and such, and I still have a lot of questions about, like, a lot of things, so, and, or, sorry, I'm not really sure about a lot of things yet. And like, what I want to know is how do I know like what questions to ask, if that makes sense? Like, yep, great. That sounds great. I mean, the very fact that you just expressed that, that that's what's on your heart. So I think the great example of the woman at the well is what was on her heart is what she expressed. And then there was another question that came after the answer to the first question. Mm-hmm. And then another question that came after that answer. And that's great. I think the dangerous place to be is when we stop asking that's questions. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, so wherever you are, whatever you're thinking, ask that question. Mm-hmm. And the next question will come. But keep asking. Yep. And if you're 30 year old kid, I appreciate you having that heart as a young, wherever you consider yourself, a young <laughs> pursuer of truth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but the older Christians that have been around for 30 years need to have that same. That's what drives me to be in school. I love, I have so many questions. I, and the more I study, the more questions I have. Um, but that's what keeps your faith alive, too. So thank you. That's great. Amen. Dave, thank you so okay. much. Amen. 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 You know, uh, <clears throat> this, this journey of faith that we're all on is so exciting. And I can tell you this. Being a Christian now for 33 years, um, it is just really exciting the next 30 years for me. It, it, is, it is discussions with Dave and, uh, and talks like this that my, my goal in, in having Dave come is to help us to ask questions. And let me say this, no question is a bad question. And questioning actually expresses our faith in God, not, it does not express our lack of faith. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's what I want us to get to, 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 to see and to think. Like I've talked about, 
We want to be a thinking congregation about why do we believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we question something, let me say it again, does not express a lack of faith. Mm -hmm. It expresses your faith. Mm -hmm. And it actually deepens your faith. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to be. If we're going to reach this community, yeah. um, it has got to be with people who are expanding their minds, broadening how we read the scripture, deepen our spiritual life, expand our awareness and our education, and, and that's what we want to be. I, I'm Amen. telling you, uh, I am so, so excited to grow with you as we learn about who our great God is. And so let me let me quell one uh, 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 thing in your mind. We will never answer all the questions about God, ever. Yeah. Because we will see, He will cease to be God the That's day right. we answer all the questions about God. Just think about that for a, for a while, okay? It's okay. Uh, and um, so today was just the first hour. Yeah. We're gonna yeah. spend. A, we're gonna drain them dry tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and so come in. I want to encourage you. Uh, 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 Dave said, uh, especially for the uh, earlier part. Uh, the four chapters of Jonah, go ahead. It'll, it'll take you 15, 20 minutes to go ahead and read it so that we can come in and uh, uh, educate it, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, on our sermon tomorrow. Thank you guys so much. Um, Alex, thanks for setting this all up. Really, really yeah. appreciate it. And you know, I, I don't do this publicly for many people, um, and not because of any other reason that I don't like, but uh, then it's uh, Danielle's birthday today, oh, and Pedro's birthday today, <laughs> and uh, we, 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 we really, we, we, I try not to do that on a Sunday morning because invariably we forget someone, okay, yeah. all right, but this is, this is not that, so let's go ahead and sing Danielle and Pedro, happy birthday, happy birthday.